Hello, my fourth grade friends. Um, I'm posting this a little late because it was super noisy in the building today, so I didn't want to record with all the noise happening. It's not noisy now. So here we go. We are on chapter 18. Um, last time when we left off, they, um, Kate and Tom, had just had kind of a runaway train experience. Remember, they were in the mountains and they were kind of this unstoppable downward race and they almost went off the tracks on a corner and then when it finally leveled off they looked out ahead and they were going to be driving right into the ocean that's where we left off chapter 18 is called the wise island this time Kate didn't bother yelling anything like look out or oh no or even help it was already too late. All she could do was watch the wild blue surf come thundering up at them. She closed her eyes. If she had to die at the age of 11, she supposed that crashing into a nameless ocean in a speeding steam train with her brother and a bunch of talking animals at least had some flair to it. She would have an outstandingly compelling obituary. An obituary is the thing they write about you after you die that goes in the newspaper or maybe they read it at your funeral. But she didn't die. Instead, the silver arrow swooshed right down into the water. Kate wished she could have watched it from a distance because it would have looked so cool. The massive black steam engine charged right into the rolling surf, butting and smashing through the waves, throwing spray everywhere, seawater hissing off its hot boiler. And then the water parted and formed a luminous emerald tunnel down into the ocean, and the silver arrow shot right down into it. Gradually, foot by foot, the tracks descended under the water, following the slope of the ocean floor. Shifting green sunlight filtered down through the ocean overhead, quickly cooling into a deep blue dusk as the tunnel took them farther below the surface. Sound became muffled. Rocks and seaweed and schools of silvery fish rolled past, eyeing them curiously and flashing their bright sides. Wow, said Kate. Wow, wow, what is even happening? Click, bing, don't ask me, but it's beautiful. Kate reached out the window and let her fingertips skim along the side of the water tunnel. A big blue blunt-headed fish a yard long floated past, nibbling at rocks, trailing a cloud of smaller fish that clung close to its sides. The silver arrow steamed along deeper and deeper under the sea till the water around them was almost black and the air got cold enough that Kate put on her heavy coat. The last thing they saw before the light faded completely was the enormous shadowy bulk of a sperm whale gliding slowly and majestically overhead like a blimp. Then the water was as black as night, broken only by the starry lights of a few phosphorescent fish. At some point, Kate couldn't have said exactly when, the tracks ran under the ocean floor itself, and the blackness became the blackness of an underground tunnel. <clears throat> she turned on the lights. The tunnel lasted for a good half hour before they came back up into the dark water, then deep blue, then green, brighter and brighter until finally they burst out into a world of hot sunlight and white sand. It was so beautiful that Kate throttled down and hit the brakes, even though they weren't at a station. They were on a low sandy island in the middle of a glittering blue sea. Most of Kate's experiences of beaches hadn't been at the ocean. They'd been at Lake Michigan, and they'd been a bit of a letdown. To save money, her family usually went in the off-season when it wasn't really warm enough, and the beaches were narrow and gray, not very clean. This was nothing like that. The sand here was fine and soft as flour and almost as white. It stretched up into a graceful grassy-topped dune. This is practically my natural habitat, the fishing cat said, and she bounded off into the water. The heron strode after her and they proceeded to have a fishing contest, though it was hard to tell who won because they both kept eating their fish. The mom, excuse me, the mamba sunned himself in the sand. You warm-blooded creatures can have no idea what this feels like, he said. Literally none. It's what ice must feel like when it's melting. I think I have some idea, Kate said. I was a tree for a while. Kate and Tom took off their shoes and race, raced each other to the top of the dune, kicking up sprays of sand as they ran. From there, they could see almost the whole island, an oval of white, 
excuse me, an oval of white sand all by itself in the middle of an infinite ocean. We must be the only people around for hundreds of miles, Kate thought. They fetched food from a dining car and borrowed a blanket from the sleeper car and had a picnic. The porcupine sat on the blanket with them, contentedly gnawing on a carrot. The baby pangolin bumbled around, playing games in the sand. He'd gotten much more active lately, sniffing and exploring everything with his startlingly long tongue. He had four legs, but toddled around mostly on two, stooped over like a tiny, scaly old man. I wonder how long this is going to last, Kate said. What, the picnic? This whole thing, the train, the animals, the adventure, feels like it's been weeks. I mean, I love it, but I miss Mom and Dad. Yeah, I do too, Tom said. I know we have to get the animals where they're going, but surely some of them could do it the old-fashioned way, you know, like geese do. Kate let her mind drift. wonder if this island has a name, she said sleepily. Of course it does, said Tom. It's the Wise Island. Well, how could you possibly know that? The train told me. Oh, Kate said. Well, what's so wise about it? Well, you can dig for treasure. Kate liked the sound of that, although she still didn't see where the wisdom came into it, and she was skeptical, as ever, about anything free. You can dig for treasure anywhere, she said. Nobody ever finds any. That's the thing. You know how everybody always digs in the sand at the beach but never finds anything? Here, if you dig, you find something. What, automatically? He nodded. Everybody finds one thing. Like gold and silver? I don't know, Tom said. I don't think it's that kind of treasure, but the train said it's different for everybody. They didn't dig right away. First, they walked up and down the beach a couple of times, surveying the area, sometimes skipping away from the waves that slid up on the sand, sometimes letting them wash over their bare feet. They found some shells, beautiful candy-striped pink and white ones. The water was warm and clear as glass. You could see fish darting around in it just out of reach. Kate and Tom debated where they should dig. They weren't sure whether the location mattered, if you automatically found something anyway, but you never knew. Kate wondered what kind of treasure they could po Kate wondered what kind of treasure could possibly be there in the middle of absolute nowhere. Eventually, Tom chose a spot well up the beach, above the tide marks, near where the dunes started. Kate ended up walking all the way back to where they'd first sat down, where the mambo was still sunning himself blissfully in the powdery sand. She plopped down on the picnic blanket and started scooping out a hole with her hands right next to it. She quickly got down past the sun-warmed upper layer and into the cold, coarse, wet sand underneath. She dug farther and farther, as deep as her elbows, and then even farther, till she'd reached the water level and her fingers were getting raw and she had to lean her whole arm down into the hole up to her shoulder. She wondered if Tom could have been pranking her. But no, he was still digging away at his own hole. Maybe the island had decided that she wasn't worthy. Just then her fingers brushed something hard and smooth. It was so far down she could barely scrabble at it with her fingertips, but she stretched and stretched, and finally she managed to hook her fingers under it. It was stuck fast in the sand, but she tugged and heaved at it until it finally pulled free. It was a small, flat metal box, closed tight with a clasp. Kate wondered what kind of treasure could possibly come from a box that small. She undid the latch and opened it. Inside the box was a little case, and inside the case, which was lined with deep blue velvet, was a pair of tortoise shell glasses. There was a neat handwritten tag tied to the glasses with string, and it said, These are the glasses that Grace Hopper wore when she first learned to program a computer. They just looked like ordinary glasses, but to Kate, they were more precious than a diamond-studded tiara. Grace Hopper's eyes looked through these same lenses, she thought to herself. Through these frames, Grace Hopper read the things that her furiously smart brain told her furiously smart fingers to type. Things that had changed history. They were kind of cool looking too, in a retro, vintage kind of way. Kate carefully placed the glasses back in their case and closed it. She would keep them forever. Her vision was perfect, but she decided that as soon as possible, she would ruin it by reading too much and writing too much brilliant code, and then she would wear these glasses for the rest of her life. <coughs>
She was about to show Tom what she'd found, but he'd found something too. He was holding a small, tattered, stuffed fox, orange, with a brown tail. He was hugging it with tears running down his face. Kate knew that fox. His name was Foxy, full name Foxy Jones. He was the one that Tom had lost on that skiing trip all those years ago, the one that he'd had since he was a baby, and the one that he thought he'd lost forever. And now Foxy Jones was back for good. Chapter 19, The Twilight Star. Then one day, as the train was puffing across a plain of scrub so flat that it looked like somebody had made it with a ruler, and the little pangolin had graduated to eating tiny bits of raw hamburger from the dining car, which they were all very proud of him for, Kate strolled back through the passenger cars and noticed that they were looking emptier than usual. Fewer animals were getting on, and more were getting off. A few days after that, they were down to just the animals from the library. The fishing cat, the white-bellied heron, the green mamba, and the porcupine. Plus the sleeping polar bear and the baby pangolin. That was when they started what was, in some ways, the hardest part of the whole trip. They crossed into a frozen desert, mile after mile of empty sand dunes covered in thin tiger stripes of frost and snow. They steamed across it for days. Dry, powdery snow and sand whispered and rattled against the window panes when the wind blew. The porcupine was grumpier than usual and complained that he wasn't getting his fair share of time with the pangolin. Once, they came to a tunnel with a sign outside that said, Danger! Falling Rocks! And Kate and Tom had to get a squeaky old hand car out of one of the boxcars and pump it along ahead of the train all the way through the tunnel in the freezing cold to make sure the tracks were clear. Another time, the Silver Arrow almost ran out of water until Tom remembered that they had a whole swimming pool car full of it. At night, either Kate or Tom would sit up with the Silver Arrow while the other ones slept, curled up in their cozy bunk in the sleeper car. They kept an eye out for dangerous curves and warning signals and steep slopes and anything that might be blocking the tracks. More than once, they had to stop and shovel away drifts of wind-blown sand. It went on for so long that Kate started to wonder how much more she could take. There were dark shadows under her eyes, and when she closed them, all she saw was more tracks scrolling past her. She was so tired, she kept bumping into hot brass pipes in the cab and burning herself. At the same time, the bitter chill of the desert spread deeper into the train, so they could see their breath inside, and even when Kate huddled up right next to the firebox, she still couldn't seem to get warm. Where am I? Kate thought. What am I doing out here? felt like she'd been on the Silver Arrow forever. It was the adventure of a lifetime, but it was a whole lot of work, too, and it was taking a really long time. Then one morning, very early, in the still frozen hour right before dawn, the train slowed down again. She looked out the window, but they were not at a station. Click, bing, look up ahead. Kate yawned, stretched, stuck her head out the window and saw what it meant. What the heck is that? I would also like to know what the heck that is. It was hard to be sure, but up ahead in the darkness, it looked like the land dropped away in a sheer cliff. But the tracks didn't stop at the cliff. They kept on going, right out over the cliff and into thin air. Kate got out of the train and walked ahead in the glow of the Silver Arrow's headlight. At first, the tracks kept going straight, but as her eyes got more used to the darkness, Kate saw that farther on they curved upward like roller coaster tracks, steeper and steeper until they ran straight up into the dark cloudy sky. Kate chewed her lip, thinking. She walked back to the train. How are we going to get up that? She said. You can't go up that, can you? No. Kate thought for a while. Is there another way around? Kate asked. I don't think so. Can you go backward? Yes. Then maybe we should go back, Kate said. Maybe we should. Kate didn't say anything. She pressed her icy hands against her face. She was so tired and so cold. All she could think about was running into her house and diving into her warm old bed and sleeping for a week. But that would mean abandoning her job, which was to get these animals to where they were going. 
And they weren't just animals, they were her friends. But what else could she do? It was impossible, it was out of her hands. And the idea of quitting made her sad, but it also, she hated to admit it, filled her with infinite relief. Maybe this job was too big for her. She was only 11 after all. I don't wanna give up, she said, but her voice sounded hollow. She really, really wanted to give up. No one would blame you. Could I still keep the glasses? Her voice was very small. Grace Hopper's glasses, even if we don't really finish the job? You could even keep the glasses, but they wouldn't have finished. That bothered Kate. It felt like the kind of thing the old Kate would have done, the person she was back before all this started. Being on the train had taught her to take responsibility for things, not just play things, but real things. But some things were simply impossible, and that was a reality too. Why don't you take a walk? How's that gonna help? Don't ask me, I don't even have legs. But humans always seem to do it when they need inspiration. So she took a walk. If nothing else, it might warm her up. She didn't leave the train. Instead, she did something that everybody always wants to do, but hardly anybody ever gets to, which is to walk along the roof of a train. Whenever you take a train, you can clearly see there are ladders to get up there, but for some ridiculous reason, nobody's ever allowed to use them, except train conductors and people having fistfights in action movies. Now was her chance. She climbed up a ladder onto the roof of a passenger car and set off. It wasn't even hard. The roof was about 10 feet wide, though it did curve slightly upward in the middle, and there was a gap between the cars that was just wide enough to make her heart flutter. She wondered if she could do this when the train was moving. How cool would that be? But she was just distracting herself. That was something the animals never did, she realized. People looked down on animals, but animals never made excuses or felt sorry for themselves. It would never occur to them. They always looked problems in the face. Kate walked all the way back to the caboose, which she'd never even visited before. It was painted red and there was a small stove inside and bunks and a desk. It was like a clubhouse. The very back there was a balcony where you could sit and watch the track reel out behind you. She made a mental note to come back here later. Though then she remembered there might not be a later. It was when she was walking back that Kate noticed a very old set of rusty brown tracks leading off through the grass and into a grove of trees. They were as old and rusty as the ones behind her house used to be. She climbed down and followed them. It was still bitter cold, but at least the sun was rising now. She stepped from one old thick wooden tie to the next until she reached the trees. She didn't exactly find inspiration there, but she did find another steam engine. It was just standing there on a siding, which Kate now knew was a piece of track where you stored trains that nobody was using. Nobody had used this steam train for a long time. Its paint was gone and rust had turned the train completely brick red. In places, it had eaten right through the metal and you could see into the darkness of the big boiler where the steam used to be. All the glass in the windows was gone. Grass and weeds had grown up through the spokes of the rusty wheels, which would never turn again. Once it must have been as fast and proud and powerful as the silver arrow. It had thundered down tracks, snorting steam and hauling long strings of cars. Those days were gone. You could never fix this train. It was way past that. But you could still make out its name in very, very faint, faded paint. The Twilight Star. Kate reached out and touched the brittle, flaking metal. I'm sorry, Twilight Star, she said. I'll bet you were a great train. This was it. This was what Uncle Herbert had asked them to look out for. Well, she'd found it. It wasn't a real star. It was a train. She wondered who had left it there. Did they know it was forever when they left? Did they tell it they'd come back but then never did? A robin flitted out through the train's window and off into the brightening air. Must have a nest in there, Kate thought. So at least it had the birds to keep it company. Kate walked back to the Silver Arrow with her head full of thoughts. I found something, Kate said. An old train called the Twilight Star. Oh. Have you heard of it? That was the name of the train before me, the one that didn't come back. 
So that's what happened to it. This must have been as far as it got. It must have broken down here and its conductors must have given up and gone home. Oh, but then what would have happened to them? Nothing. That was the end of their adventure. Well, what about the animals? I guess they had to fend for themselves. It wouldn't have been easy, but they're used to it. Kate didn't say anything more for a while. She sat and looked around at the Silver Arrow's cab, which had seemed so weird when she'd first seen it, and which now felt so much like home. She imagined it old and rusty and ruined, like in, like in the Twilight Star, sitting all by itself in the wind and rain and snow, alone and abandoned. I would never leave you here, she said quietly. But the Silver Arrow didn't answer. Maybe it didn't believe her. Maybe it was right. She couldn't go back, but she didn't know how to go forward either. She knew it was wrong to give up, but when people said you should never give up, they never talked about how hard it is to keep going. Maybe part of being an adventurer was knowing when the adventure was over. Maybe that was another one of those life lessons she was supposed to be learning. But then she thought about the animals and the silver arrow. She closed her eyes and a tear squeezed out. She wiped it away and walked back to the library car. We're going to stop there. Next week is going to be chapter 20 and it is called Chins chins. I don't know why because I haven't read it yet, but we're going to find out together. Thanks for being here. I hope you can come to Live Library next week, but if not, you can look right here for whatever it is we read. See you later.